You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 144. You can't edit a blank page. Jody Pukashlot. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now, guys, today on the show, we have writer, HBO executive, television producer, and recovering television uh, executive, <laughs> Kelly Edwards. I say that jokingly because we talk about that in the show. Kelly Edwards is the author of the new book, The Executive Chair, A Writer's Guide to Television Series Development. And Kelly, we, we me and Kelly had a fantastic conversation about not only the development of story, development of series, but seeing it from the other side of the desk, from the development executive side. And we went into the weeds about uh, what it's like to be a television executive. She worked at HBO, HBO Max, Turner, and she was the key corporate diversity executive at Comcast NBC Universal for over five years, where she oversaw over 20 divisions, launching employee resources groups and introducing diversity of creative talent to NBC, USA, Sci-Fi, Bravo, and Telemundo. She has been around the block, to say the least. And Kelly and I had a wonderful, wonderful conversation about uh, the business, about what happens behind the scenes, what it really takes to get a series off the ground, what people are looking for in today's world for getting a series. And she has now recently transitioned from inside the network ranks into a writing and producing deal with HBO under her production company. So I, I want you guys to sit back and get ready for a heck of an episode. You're going to have to take out a lot of notes because Kelly and I get into it. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Kelly Edwards. I'd like to welcome to the show Kelly Edwards. How are you doing, Kelly? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I'm excited to talk to you because you've got your new book coming out, The Executive Chair, which is the executive's uh, point of view for of the entire television process and, and actually what it takes to make a television show and all of that. And I really wanted to kind of dig in because that's kind of the mystery. That's like the man or woman behind the curtain for a lot of writers. Yeah. Like they want to know what's going on. They all want to go to Oz. Uh, <laughs> they all want to I don't know. Everybody wants to go to Oz. Everybody thinks they want to go to Oz. That's a better, that's a better. Oh, trust me. I understand. Everybody wants to be in the film business. (laughs) There are a lot of wicked witches in Oz. (laughs) Don't forget. (laughs) And there's not nearly enough houses dropping on them. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you get started in the business? Oh, uh, well, let's see. I, I got into the business right after college. I came home uh, and my dad's like, you've got to you've got to get a job and I'm kicking you out of the house. And so I knew I needed to work and I always wanted to be a part of the industry. I just didn't know in what capacity. And I ended up getting a, 
sort of a hookup from a friend who was working for a very uh, well-known manager, talent manager, and he was leaving the job and there was another person coming in a month later and they said, oh, would you bridge the gap between you know him leaving and this new person coming in? And it was only a month. And so I went to work for this manager um, and then I proceeded to be terrible at it. I was it's just an, an awful assistant, uh, and I screwed up more things than I care to admit. And uh, But before I got fired, um, there was another job across the street working for a casting company called The Casting Company. And I went and I walked, worked there and, and vowed to be a better assistant than I had been before. And that was sort of, you know, I was off to the races. It was, um, I've always said that every job that I've ever had in this business has been a hookup from a, from a friend. So one thing has led to another and led to another. I've never gotten a job as a cold call. I've never just blindly sent my inter- my resume in and it had an interview. It's always been, there's been some connective tissue from the last job to the next job. And so I got on this road working for as an assistant for this casting company and one of the casting directors who was there, Denise Chamian, happened to be friends with a guy named Jerry Brzezigian, who was um, just coming off of a deal. Uh, he'd just been writing with Don Siegel on The Jeffersons, and they were looking for an assistant. So I went to work for them. And that really was the, the real, I think, kickoff to what I'm doing now because I was a writer's assistant. And we were in development, and then there was a, they had a show on CBS, and they were in development on a, a number of projects. And I got to see the real nitty gritty of not only being in production, but also the de- development process from the writer's side. And I really thought I was going to be a writer then. But looking around the, the landscape of television at the time, there weren't a lot of black women on shows. And, um, and so I decided, well, look, I've got to get a job because my dad's breathing down my neck and I've got to make some money. <laughs> and, um, and so I ended up uh, – I ended up going in the, into the executive route, which I loved. And, you know, I, it was still working with the written word. It was still working with writers. It was still being super, super creative. And I, I went on that road for many, many years. I started in features and then in, went into film. And I was sorry, features. And then when I went into television and rose up through the ranks on the television side and then uh, worked at, at Fox, worked at uh, UPN as the head of comedy development and then decided that I needed to have another skill set because, you know, there's a life expectancy to every Mm -hmm. executive and I could see my expiration date coming down the pike. Um, and I left UPN to go have my own production company. I partnered up with a guy named Jonathan Axelrod who had a deal at Paramount and together we were in business for about six years. We had a show on the air um, and I got to see, you know, the selling side of it, which was an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. Because as a buyer, you know, you're in this reactionary, you're receiving pitches, but you're not really in it. Mm-hmm. And then as the as the seller and working with the studios and then going out and pitching, I was learning a whole new skill set that was really, really important to having career longevity. And so I did that for about six years and then um we folded the company in 2007, and um, and I went to work for NBC Universal on um, in the diversity capacity. And it was a very big corporate job, and I had 20 networks reporting to me, and and did a lot of um, work with the presidents of all the different divisions. We did a lot of uh, diversity workouts and a lot of big, big, gigantic uh, projects in the diversity space. And then I went to HBO to work for um, to, to set up their their diversity efforts, which really consisted of the writers and directors programs, the cinematog- mm-hmm. cinematographers programs, and a lot of emerging artists programs over there. Um, and then uh, and then at the top of last year, uh, they came to me and said uh, there had been a big shift because you know the AT and T merger had happened and a lot of things were changing. A lot of people were were um, changing chairs over there. And they came to me with a with a big offer and said, "Look, you can have this this huge this huge increase in pay. We're going to give you worldwide diversity, and wow. um, you know, don't you want to do this?" And I said, um, "I said no, because by that time, over the last couple of years, I had gone back to um, to school to get my MFA in screenwriting and TV writing, and also I had gotten into Sundance. And the experience of those two things together really showed me that." 
I had really been living in the wrong skin for a long time. I was probably supposed to be a writer all along. And I had poured all of my energy into making other people's dreams come true and helping them and really learning along the way as I was teaching them mm-hmm. about television writing. And this was my chance to do it on my own. And it was a huge, huge risk because, you know, you've given up a, a 401k and a cush paycheck every other week um, and great health care to, to go off on my own and start my own thing. So that was the long story. That's the, that's the whole, that's the whole Megillah about how I got from there to here. Wow. But it's been a crazy, crazy fulfilling last 12 months that I have been on my own under this. I'm going to say it's a first look HBO deal, but also I'm on a staff of a show. So it's it's my dream has really come true over the last 12 months. And I feel like I feel so renewed where I feel like, you know, many people get to this part in their career and they just kind of go, well, let me just ride it out until retirement. Mm-hmm. I only have a few more years left. Let me just sort of enjoy it. And I'm just getting started. Yeah. And, you know, I, what I love about your story is that, and this is only because of age, because as we get older, we don't realize this when we're in our 20s or even our 30s for that matter, is that you're, I love the comment, I was in the wrong skin the entire time. And we don't yeah. kind of realize what makes us happy till later. Some people are very lucky and they get that right away. But most of us don't. And, but we played in the arena we weren't the gladiators, but we but we helped the gladiators put their armor on. Right. We were next to it. We could smell it. We organized the the, the battles, if you will, if you use this, this analogy. Um, but we really wanted to be in the arena, and uh, I did that for a long time. I mean, I was a, I wanted to be a director, uh, and before I started directing, I was in post. And I lived in post. I was like, I'm close to it. I'm adding skill sets. And that's great for a year or two. But then you you fast forward 10 or 15 years, you're just like, am I, I'm not happy anymore. I'm like, I'm not right. happy at this. I got to do what I love. And then when I started doing what I love, then that's what made me happy. I think that's some, a big, big lesson everyone listening should really understand is be true to that voice inside of you. Because you can, you can muffle that voice for years. It'll come back you up. Can. It'll come back out. It'll come back out at one point. But you're like, like, I've turned down, my God, when I was, I only had two staff jobs ever in my life and I got fired promptly from both of them uh, <laughs> because I was so miserable in them. But they were cush jobs, obscene money for the time. And I just like, but I'm not happy. So it's not about right. the money and it's not about the security. No. It's like, you got to. It's very seductive though. Oh, so I, I so... man, not having to hustle for that check every week as, you know, freelancing, you got to hustle. But when you got right. that check coming in, oh, 401k, oh, I don't have to worry about health care. Oh, it's 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 very seductive. But uh, it's something but that people your soul can your soul can die a little every day inside. Oh, absolutely. And I was feeling I was feeling after a while that my soul was dying. And I, I knew that if even if I got out and did it for only a month or two months or I, you know, if I had to go back and, you know, uh, you know, work work for McDonald's or, you know, mm-hmm. scrape tar off of somebody's shoe or something after that, that that however many months I had would have been worth it. And that's when you know that it, you just have to do something. It's sort of like when, when, you, when I think of, um, I, I'm not even sure if I'm going to articulate this well, but it's almost as though you have this light inside you and you know that if you keep, keep trying to patch it over, you know, you keep trying to sort of put something over so it doesn't really shine, but then, Eventually, it's going to eke out somewhere. It's going to burst out somewhere. Mm-hmm. And you might as well just open up the bag and just let it burst out everywhere because I've literally never had this much joy in mm-hmm. in my entire life in any job. And I've loved my jobs. I loved working mm-hmm. you know, in development. It was a great experience. But there's nothing that compares to what, what I've been living this last year. And we were talking a little bit before the uh, before we started recording uh, about the angry and bitter filmmaker and screenwriter. And, and it, like I, I always think the joke is, you know, in front of a in front of an audience, I'll go, everybody here knows an angry and bitter filmmaker. And if you don't know an angry, bitter filmmaker or screenwriter, you are the angry and bitter screenwriter. Those angry and bitter filmmakers and screenwriters are the people who are not doing what they love to do and they're in a job or in a place that they're not fulfilling what they want, generally speaking. Now, right. they're, they're probably different right. v- variations. But because I was, I was pissed. 
I was so bitter and angry. And I used to be in an editing room and I used to see like a 25 year old walk in with a $3 million movie. I'm like, and I'm looking at the movie. I'm like, this movie sucks. I'm fixing everything for this guy. And he doesn't right. even, he's never even seen Blade Runner. What's going on? Like, it's a, so, so what changed for you then? Uh, 40. <laughs> Okay. 40. I was 40 and I, I launched uh, Indie Film Hustle. Indie Film Hustle was the thing that really took me to a place of happiness because I was able to give back. I found my, I found my calling. My calling is to right. be an artist uh, and to be a creative, but Indie Film Hustle affords me the opportunity to do that uh, whenever I want. When I, and, and also my joy comes from writing a book, doing a podcast mm-hmm. Uh, okay. writing an article, show, uh, yeah. um, movie, um, shooting a movie, uh, speaking in front of people. I found all of that. And I was like, oh, great. I don't have just one outlet anymore because if I can't, because that sucks. Yeah, <laughs> when you only have right. the one outlet, if that outlet closes, you're screwed. I found five or six okay. or eight different things that make me truly happy, that gets me up in the morning. And and they all work within the same world for the most part. Sure. So that's what right. kind of changed. And then when I changed Ferdy, I was like, I got to I gotta go shoot a movie. And I went and shot a film, my first feature, sold it to Hulu and, uh, you know, crowdfunded it and did the whole thing. And that was, the, that was a turning point, really. Um, but it was the audience that really gave me the strength to do that. I was, I was scared to do that prior to having Indie Film Hustle. So for me, it was just like, uh, you know what, uh, I'm going to go do this. And if it doesn't work, <laughs> I, got, I got my show. I can come back to my okay, show, right. you know, and yeah. and also just the joy I get to meet meeting people like yourself, you know, to sit down and talk to someone like you for an hour. Uh, there's people out there that would kill to have that opportunity to get that kind of access to someone like yourself or any of the of the wonderful guests I get on my show. And I get that opportunity daily or weekly. Right. And that is massive. And I get to talk to people at a very high level in the industry and very high level executives and high level writers and Oscar winners and all this kind of stuff. And it just, it gets me jazzed. <laughs> right. So. Well, you know, you, you said a couple of things that I think are really interesting. First of all, you didn't really wait for anybody else to give you that opportunity. Correct. You made that opportunity. And not only that, but you said you found many avenues for that. And I love to tell people sometimes your vision, you can't have such a myopic vision of what success looks like that you think, oh, I need to work at X. Like if you said, you know, yesterday, tomorrow, whatever, I want to go work at ABC, you would then work, you would then completely miss working for Hulu and working for, you know, Audible. (laughs) Like your, your creative muscle might, might be doing something completely different that still gives you that same satisfaction. And I think you did that. You found the speaking, you found the the book, you found the podcast, you found the film. All of those are creative endeavors, and you were able to get that satisfaction and that love and that joy in your um, in your life through things that didn't necessarily look like, well, I had to do my fifty million dollar Universal picture, <laughs> because I think that's what sometimes when we when we think about oh right. we want this career, that's what it looks like. Oh, I, but no, that's there, not all the things that can give you joy. Oh, there's absolutely no question. And I know people listening right now are like, well, what is, what is success for you? Well, like I have to go win an Oscar. I have to work on a hundred million dollar movie. I have to go work for Marvel or I have to go work for HBO and do, you know, a game of Thrones spinoff and I have to be in the writers. Like that's, it's a very specific goal. And my experience, I don't know about you is, uh, whenever I've made goals like that, um, the universe laughs at me uh, because it's just yes. does, it does it never falls into <laughs> if you would have told me 10 years ago <laughs> that I would have a podcast and that podcast would give me access to some of the biggest minds and highest big powered people in Hollywood from my little room in Burbank at the time when I was starting this now I'm in Austin I would have laughed at you. Of course, it sounds ridiculous. Oh, and because of that, you're going to be able to do this and this and this and this. None of which were in my, none of which were in my plan. But you have to be open to what the universe gives you. And that's the thing that I always find. 
I found in my in my uh, elder years because I'm geriatric now because I just broke my foot. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but no, in in my in my years come is being open to what comes. And I, I as a young man, I was not. I was closed off. It had to be. I had to be Quentin Tarantino. I had to be Robert Rodriguez. I had to be Steven Spielberg. Do you know how many directors walked into this business like I'm going to be the next Steven Spielberg? Like no, you're not. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Not because you're not capable of it, but you're talking about, I'm going to be the next Michelangelo. Like that's who you're talking about. Like there's a hand, there's a handful of masters who we all look up to. And even Spielberg was looking up to Kurosawa and Kubrick and all these other, we all do it. But you have to be the best version of you. And whatever that takes you, it's okay. As long as you're happy and you're helping people and you're expressing yourself as an artist and you're making a living, that's the goal of life. And I and that was the other thing. I don't need millions of dollars. And that was another mm-hmm. big thing because a lot of people think filmmaking is about millions of dollars and fame and fortune. When you're young, that's what you think about. But at, as you get older, you're like, you know what? Can I pay my bills? Can I support my family? Right. Um, I think I'm good. Like I don't need, you know, ten million dollars a year. It'd be nice, and I'd be able to right. do some fun stuff with it. But it's not gonna make me happy. What makes me happy is doing right. what I do. So that's, and it may or may not come. The millions of dollars may or may not come. Who knows? And that's fine. But and that's fine. If you're enjoying it, yes, exactly, exactly. And I think you're 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 just as much of a fanatic about film as I am mm-hmm. and I, I've listened to your podcast and I love the fact that you do these deep dives and that you have the screenplays that you can sort of dissect online that that I never get enough of just having conversations about content mm-hmm. and I think that for me if I if I had to go work at a desk job and push paper I, I would just shoot myself curl up in a little ball absolutely and so any chance that i get no matter where it is being in touch with other people who love this is life-giving for me uh absolutely it is a it is it is a joy to be able to do what i do every day and i and, and the privilege and i try to uh i try to take advantage of it as much as i can every day but it's about giving back honestly i mean so much is our conversation i'm asking you questions that i want answered personally and then everybody gets to kind of listen into our conversation these are conversations that you would have at a bar at a festival or at a commissary or on a set and i was like you know i want to have those i've had so many of those in my career i'm like man i wish i would have recording that one or wish you know like that little gem that would have been great and that's what i do for a living and i'm able to jazz myself up but also give the opportunity to millions of people around the, the world to listen to uh to our conversations and hopefully help them along their path because i would have killed for the an opportunity to have a podcast like mine to listen to when i was coming up in my 20s exactly <laughs> oh my god i would right, kill for right. it it would have saved me so much pain <laughs> but we've gone off we're, a little bit we're dealing with JV, jvc tapes and uh, oh my you know. god don't don't go how old are we oh god stop it <laughs> stop it <laughs> i was cutting on a three i i was cutting i was cutting on a three quarter inch uh sony system putting putting reels together for a commercial house back in the 90s (laughs) and i was there i was there and that's how old i am uh i was i was their apple tech uh for all the the whole production company i was the the tech for all the computers which were all the the little macs and the little boxes the little box maxes and there was no wi-fi so in order to network everything, you had to use Apple Talk. And, oh my God. and that was a cable that you would cook. And it was just like a long daisy chain cable across the entire company. <laughs> and if somebody had to happen, I swear to God, if someone kicked one open and knocked the entire network out and I would literally have to go and hunt down where did it get kicked out and then plug it back. It was wow. insane. But okay, we have gone. Okay, all right. Wait, wait, wait. I will give you my, my first. So I used to work on a Selectric typewriter when I was doing my oh, first, Jesus. um, my, you know, working for my, my two writers. And then I was so excited when we, when we converted to Wang computers. <laughs> so that was the big thing. And I loved typing on it because it made a little clicking sound and I thought, Ooh, this is so cool. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'll, I'm going to go toe to toe with the uh, oldest the, person on the planet. Hey, listen, uh, um, the, 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 the struggle was real. The struggle was real. <laughs> I just want to put that out there for everybody. Now everyone listening is like, okay, Alex, enough with the old, the two okay. old, far, the two old farts. Uh, okay. At least one old fart 
I, you look much younger than me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're, I'm just, I'm saying we're right, right there. This is, this is the good news though. I just made a transition in my life and my career and I'm uh, 30 plus years into the business. So mm -hmm. I just turned 58 mm -hmm. and I've just got the staff for the first time. So if anybody is out there listening, going, I don't know if I can make a change Absolutely, you can. when I'm, you know, an adult, mm -hmm. I've got three kids. They're all adults. They're all legal. Then, you know, you can, you absolutely can. You just have to put your mind to it and you have to make a plan. But don't ever let anybody tell you you can't make a change. A amen. Amen. Now, um, the executive ranks, which is is a mystery to me. Executives get a bad rap uh, as a general statement in the film side and the television side. It's the evil executives. This is the, this is the, a lot of writers think this way. It's the sure. evil executives who come down with their notes. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't understand what's going on. Um, what, first of all, what are the executive ranks? Is, is there like a specific kind of per, you know, like I, I have no idea what the ranks are. I mean, obviously I know the studio head and head of television and things like that, but the hierarchy and then, uh, let's first go into the hierarchy. What is the hierarchy of a standard, you know, executive ranks in a, at a studio? Well, I, I delineate this in the book, um, pretty early on in laying the groundwork because it is important for you to know. You know, what the levels are. When people come in, uh, usually in the executive rank, you start out as an assistant. Sometimes there's a, a level lower than that, like an associate. Some of the programs that they used to have, they, I don't think they have them anymore, it used to start with associate. Then you go to assistant and then coordinator, which is interesting because years ago, back in the 80s, coordinator and, and assistant were, were reversed. But now it's assistant, coordinator, and the coordinator is really the junior executive on that track. And they, they go from, you know, just answering phones to, and, and creating, you know, coffee meetings and, you know, lunches and, and all of that and, and scheduling travel to, okay, now you're a junior executive and you're probably getting writers lists together. You're doing a version of notes. You're sort of, you're in the meetings with the executives and then you go to manager and that's even more on that scale. So as a manager, you're really fully uh, an executive, but it, but you're still a junior executive. You're not necessarily running the meetings. You're not necessarily the person who's giving the notes to the higher up, the higher ups, but you are absolutely a utility player. You're reading a lot of scripts and you're in the game. And then there's director level. Sometimes there's an uh, executive director level. That's really just a half step. You know, somebody, somebody in HR is trying to squeeze in another step so that you don't have to get to uh, VP and you can't uh, be top heavy in your department. But then it's after director, it's VP, and then senior vice president, um, executive vice president, and then you're going to sort of get into the you know the president ranks of the of the company, and then you get up to CEO. So there are there are steps in there. You know, you learn different things at different places along the way. By the time you're a VP, you are, you can be heading your own department. Usually a director is not heading their own department, but a VP would be, uh, SVP for sure. Um, EVP is in, in charge of a division, most likely. Mm -hmm. And then president, you're in charge. And, and I think also what's interesting is that the more, the higher up you get, the less creative sometimes it gets. So if you're a president of the network, you're not necessarily in the creative meetings all the time. You're not necessarily mm -hmm. hearing the pitch. You, you've sort of uh, um, aged out of the fun stuff. And <laughs> I do know a number of people who, 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 who get to that level and they go, oh, gosh, I really loved the process of being in the middle of it with the, with the writers. And now I'm dealing with marketing and sales. And, and ratings. A lot of things. <laughs> and ratings, yeah, exactly. So so how has so how has the well when I said the evil executives uh, because I mean I mean they're it's been infamous like that in, in Hollywood for a long time um, can you just from the point of view of the executives because now you've been on both sides of the of the table um, yeah I've heard from many writers uh, and and filmmakers there are some excellent executives out there that give great notes. And really, they have an outside perspective and they really have an understanding of story. They have an understanding of character and they really do help. And then there's the 
the egocentric, you know, climbers who are just there to like, I, I gotta, I gotta give, I gotta stick my nose into this. If not, why am I here? Kind of executive. Right. Um, how do you deal with that kind of an executive as a creative? And how would you, because they have the power, they, ha- they have the keys to the car that you're driving, but yet if you let them drive, they're going to run it off the road. So there's this balance of creativity versus politics, which is, there is no book that I know of. There is no course that I know of that talks about the true politics of this industry. <laughs> and it is yeah, and it is important to understand. It is. Uh, there are a lot of things, and I think a lot of little um, pieces to this, because you have to remember it's not just on the executive side that you're, you're looking at it. You're looking at the status of the writer. So if you come in and you're a baby writer and you're getting notes from somebody, you pretty much have to take them. If you're a baby writer who's paired up with someone who can help, then you have a different level of influence. If you're coming in and you're the, you know, the top of the heap, you're Shonda Rhimes, you're not necessarily taking anybody's notes. So you're, you know, <laughs> depending on what you're, what you, you know, you can listen to them or not. So I think it depends on where you are as a writer on the food chain as well. Here's the thing about executives, though. If every executive comes into the business as someone who is a fan of entertainment in the way that we are, mm-hmm. they hopefully they're doing the work that we are. They aren't always, but they love content. So they love television shows. They love film. They love um, books. They love the creative side of the business, just like the writers do. They're just a different part of the process. And hopefully a good executive has taken the time to figure out, you know, how story, what, you know, they've read all the good books. They read, you know, the hero's journey. They've read, they, they know what they're, they're, uh, they're talking about. Some people don't do that work. And I think that's when you see a bad executive. Mm-hmm. When you see somebody who's come in, who hasn't been on in the, in the production side, you can always tell, I can always tell if somebody has or has not been in production because you see that they give notes that aren't doable or workable or even, you know, right. make sense. Um, but they don't know that because they're, they're dealing with limited information. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the executive who is a really good executive is trying to help you realize your dream, your goal. You have a story to tell. If you've gotten to the place where you're having a conversation with an executive, it's because they like your work. So already that's a good thing. It's not like they're coming in and saying, hey, I read your script and I hate it and let me you know, tear it apart for you. That's not the goal. Everyone's goal is always with good intentions. So they're going to see your material and say, this is how I think you can make it better. Sometimes the way that they deliver those notes is not great. It's, <laughs> it can be demoralizing. I think, mm-hmm. again, that's part of the executive's journey on trying to figure out how do they become the best executive they can be. And they may be, I was telling, I was talking to the director on our show this today, um, who happens to be Joe Morton, who's, um, who's in our show. And I said, I just cringe at some of the notes that I must have given as a junior executive back in the eighties. I, I want to apologize to every single person that I ever gave a note to back then, because I am sure I came with so much arrogance thinking, Oh, "Oh, well, I know better than you do. And (laughs) I'm going to help you make this better. Not realizing that that's not the way to, to anybody's heart. And I say now I actually don't give notes anymore. I, I ask questions. Because I realized along the way that the writer had a goal in mind. If they didn't make that, that um, if they didn't hit the mark, then it's not because they didn't try. It's that there's probably some missing information. You probably haven't earned those moments. You probably haven't um, given us enough information about the character. You haven't done the, done the hard work. But there's something missing that's, that's not connecting. So I ask questions because usually through a process of asking questions, there is a revelation that happens for the writer. It's not I'm dictating the note to you, but it's I'm helping you discover what you want to say and how to say it better. And that's how I approach things down. But people don't come into the business to be horrible, <laughs> to be to be to be negative And there. The goal is let me help fix it. And I think that's sometimes where the disconnect is between writers and and executives. And a writer can can receive that information in a terrible way if it's not 
if it's not given with the spirit of collaboration. Right. And, and, and there's always that thing called ego as well that gets thrown into the mix on both sides of the table. Uh, true. <laughs> so that, yeah, that, true. that we all the deal. And as, as we get older, we, you're right when, oh God, the arrogance when you're, oh man, I couldn't even sit in a room. My head was so big when I was younger. Oh my God. In my twenties. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. It was, I will fix it. You obviously, you people who've been in the business for 20 years, you don't understand. I'm here to help. Exactly. I'm here to fix this. <laughs> Just listen to me. We will guide. We will guide you right to, to the promised land. Uh, <laughs> now, how has um, how has streaming changed the game? Because you you came up in a time when there was no internet, uh, no streaming. There was no Netflix. There was none of that stuff. Both of us did. So in the 80s and 90s, you know, we were still you know there was cable, uh, and then there was more shows. But now. There's literally a th- how many how many scripted shows are there now? The thousand a year? I don't know. It's yeah, a- probably a gajillion. I'm sure. It's insane. Yeah. How has the game changed? And is a lot of the stuff that we're talking about still apply in the streaming world as well as the network world, or has streaming completely changed the paradigm? It has changed it in very significant ways, and in some ways, it hasn't changed it at all. You still need a camera and a script and an actor. So that doesn't change. It's not like the it's revolutionized it to the point where we don't recognize what we're doing. It's it's very similar in that way. Um, you still call cut. You still call action and cut. But it's changed it in obviously how the business works. Monetarily, it's changed it. Um, yeah, residuals. Even on the executives. Yeah, residuals are. Well, yeah, residuals. Gone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but if but if you think about it, even on the executive track, you know, if you go from working at a regular network to going to work for Netflix, you all of a sudden become a millionaire in a, in a couple of years. So <laughs> it's changed it in a, in a big way. You know, no, how does that work? work? No, so how does that work? Hold on a second. Let's back up for a second. So if you're an executive working at CBS and then you jump over to Netflix, why at Netflix is there, what is the compensation difference? Why is it, is it just because Netflix it's, is just giving money away like it's water? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's many times just put a, an, a times next to that number, it's double, triple, quadruple what you can get paid at a regular network. But they also don't have contracts. They also don't have um, the same kind of uh, titles. So things are different. You mm-hmm. know, I don't think that they have um, pension plans in the way that you know you you have a four hundred one k at an, at another network. So I do think that there's give and take mm-hmm. a little bit. But yeah, you are getting paid. Some nice, nice paychecks are coming into your direct deposit. But um, uh, it's changing also in a lot of other ways in that um, if you think about the way people are developing content, obviously when, when you, we went to from broadcasts and a certain number of act breaks. Now let's go, let's, let's actually jump back in time. Let's back in the time when I was coming up and I was working for Don and Jerry, mm-hmm. you know, uh, we were working in, um, four camera tape shows, you know, and we were looking at quad splits and we were, and the directors were in the booths and they were, you know, you know mm-hmm. she, counting the shots. Um, it's very, very different than we went into more, uh, when I was working at UPN in particular, we started to work in more of the single camera area. And by that time, you know, Seinfeld was around, and so shows became half our comedies were not just two acts with a you know a teaser and a tag. All of a sudden, it's three acts. It's you know when Seinfeld came out, the scenes were so, so much shorter. They were a lot of you know comedy stings, and there's just a lot of things that changed in terms of the the way that we made shows. If you watch the the pilot of Sex and the City. They have these little chirons in it. There's a, a lot of direct address. There was a lot of gimmicks that were happening around that time. We don't see those necessarily as much as we do we did then. So things are always changing. The evolution of television is always changing. The boundaries in terms of what you can and cannot say are always changing. When you get to streamers, um, we're now dealing with no act breaks. You know, we had that at we had that at HBO. We had that at HBO and Showtime and all that. But now we're dealing on a massive scale with no act breaks for your for your sh- for your shows. So you have to make sure that you are keeping a structure to it so that things are moving forward. Um, oh, um, there are uh, you have to do you have to find a way to get people to push next episode. 
in a way that you didn't have to before. So right. in broadcast from before, you'd show up every Thursday night for must see TV or you'd show up mm-hmm. every Monday night for whatever you're showing up for. And it was one episode at a time. And now we're in binging. But in order to get somebody to binge on the writer's side, my goal is now to get someone to binge. Well, I then have to figure out what is going to get them to binge. That means a more serialized kind of storytelling. Um, and that means I need to find a way at the end of, of episode one to get you to press episode, you know, to, to get to next episode. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So that changes storytelling quite a bit. You have to figure out a whole new paradigm for telling a story that might have been really successful as a one-off. Let's just say you're, you're doing um, Law & Order SVU and everything is self-contained. Mm-hmm. Well, the good news about Law & Order SVU is that you might want to do next episode just because you love Mariska Hargitay. But there is no reason that you need to do it next episode. Right. Unlike watching Queen's Gambit, I have to get to the next one because the story is not finished. Right. So we're dealing with very, very different ways of storytelling that we didn't have before. Yeah, like you know, I watched Castle. That was you know that was on forever on an ABC, and that was it's a procedural show. It had a small arc through the season, but it was a procedural show, oh. a fun procedural show, and right. so it was uh, SVU. Uh, so every week basically was a self-contained episode, but there was a small like, will she ever find her mother who killed her father or something like that? There's always that right. one little arc that carries throughout the entire episode or the entire series, a season. Um, but then something like Queen's Gambit, like that's just crack. It was absolutely right. like it, it was absolute or Squid Game. If you watch Squid Game, I have not seen like- it yet. Um, I, 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 my wife says no, cause that means I have to do it on my own now. And that's going to take me more time to do. Cause she saw, she's like, that looks way yes. too violent. And I'm like, it it's is. So, it's terrible. It's <laughs> I've been hearing and nothing about can't... it. I have to, but I have to watch yeah. it now. I have to watch it. Right. Uh, or Narcos when Narcos was, uh, the, the first three seasons of Narcos was just like, Jesus, mm-hmm. every week you just wanted to keep every week, every episode you want to keep going. Uh, and it just changes the whole way you look at story structure. Uh, you were saying evolution. You know, there was one uh, there was one show that really changed the game. Uh, I'd love to hear your point of view on it. You know, when The Sopranos showed up and David Chase created The Sopranos, um, it, yes. it, it really just changed everything. Like it changed storytelling and television. And, uh, you know, you had... Um, you know, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Dexter, Game of Thrones, right. all of these, the lineage goes right back to the Sopranos. Pre-Sopranos, a show like Breaking Bad would have never even, and it was tough to even get Breaking Bad off the air after I, the Sopranos. I want to know, when, when did The Shield come on? Was that just before, it was around the same time? It was, a, I think it was either around the same time or a little bit after this, a little bit after. I think The Sopranos was the first time there was that anti-hero in a way, it was the epi- the episode um, is fresh in my mind now because I just had the pleasure of talking to David Chase on the show, and mm. and that was a that was a trip. Uh, <laughs> there was an episode five, I think it was episode four or five. It was ep- no, it was episode five. It was called College, where Tony strangled a rat on air, like full blown. Mm. The rat didn't do anything to him. It wasn't like the guy was. And HBO had a major problem with it. They're like, you're going to destroy this character before he even gets off the ground. Nobody's going to want to follow this guy. He's your little, and they murder him right on, like in glorious daylight. Like it's bright and everything. And that was the moment it shifted. Because prior to that, you just saw instances of that, but you never saw the brutality of Tony Soprano. And that right. moment, after that episode came on, everybody was even more jazzed about seeing the show. And the executives were like, Oh, things are changing. We we don't need to have a right. happy hero anymore. We don't need to have a a guy who has moral a moral compass. We can root for the bad guy, and that was right. It kind of just shifted everything. And and movies have been doing that for a while. I mean, I mean, Goodfellas. Uh, you know, if you want to go into that genre, I mean, we were all oh, rooting sure. for we were all rooting for Scarface. Henry Hill, yeah, yeah, Scarface. Yeah, I mean, sure. you could. I mean, we were all following the. But in television, that would never done. Never, ever prior to that. So th- what is your, what's your opinion on the legacy of, of The Sopranos and then also these other shows? 
that kept pushing the envelope after The Sopranos, like a Breaking Bad, like a Mad Men, like a uh, like a Dexter, a serial killer, right. <laughs> literally exactly. a serial killer that we're rooting for. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember being out there, I think, around the time that Dexter came out with something similar. We were pitching something with a, with a couple of writers um, as, uh, under my deal at Paramount. And, yeah, it was a it became a big thing. I think I think a couple of things happened at the same time, which is when you think about The Sopranos, it was remarkable. And I would love to I, – I did not hear your David Chase – it just um, came out. It just came out today, as of this week, uh, okay. as of this recording. Okay, awesome. It came out right there, so you can listen to it after. Like, where is he? Like, what is he doing now? Because I, I mean, he yeah, dropped the crazy, he, he dropped the mic. That's basically a drop the mic situation. Mm-hmm. Like he, he I mean, he's been in the television for uh, what forty years, probably the Rockford Files right. and all this stuff. But then he was given the opportunity to do The Sopranos, and when he was doing The Sopranos, he literally just like, I don't care. I'm going to do it mm-hmm. my way and I'm going to be bold and I'm going to fight for whatever I want to do. And that's all. And they just let HBO let him do it. It's a, it's a weird, it just, everything aligned so perfectly right. at that, the timing to, for a show like that. And I think, and I think HBO was really trying to get into television in a They're big, trying to make, yeah, big swings. Right. And they took right. that. And I, I actually said that to David, I was like, you, I'm so glad you took the swing at the back because we need creators on the on bay uh, at home plate taking those swings. And I go, what would what would have happened if you would have missed? Because Sopranos could have absolutely missed. Right. And he's like, I don't know. I would have just gone back and did something else. I don't care. Yeah, it was <laughs> low stakes for him, my guess. Because yeah, for I and correct me if I'm wrong, but my guess is I think the story was that he had it at Fox first and they didn't want to do it. Oh no, it was a, it was like a, it was a feature. It was a feature oh. that he, and and he he wrote a feature first and he, so, he tried to go around town with it. Nobody wanted it. Then somebody at HBO pitched him an idea about and it wasn't a feature about the mob. It was about it was about a studio executive who had an issue with his mother, his psychotic mother, because oh. that's based on his life. That's his mom. The Sopranos mother is his mother. So when they say, write what you know, write what you know, it's exactly that. But then someone's like, Hey, do you want to do a mob, a mob show? And then he, then he connected the two and that's how, and that's how the Sopranos came. And then he did pitch it around. I think, I'm not sure who, who I got to HBO somehow. And then HBO said yes to whatever, how many, how many episodes that first season was. Uh, And they just kept going with it. But then it was just this, this magic, like you can't, as a writer, as a writer and a creator, you could do so much on the page, but then the actors show up, then the directors show up, right. then the locations show up, and then you're rewriting there. And then on the edit, mm-hmm. you're rewriting there. It's like, it, it, it's, he said it too. It's like, when you saw Tony talking to this other character, you're like, oh, I didn't see that before. Why don't we try mm-hmm. this? That's a magic that you, it's lightning in a bottle. You can't get that. And having right. free, you know this as well as anybody, having the freedom that he had at that budget range on a network like HBO is unheard of, especially at the time. Right. You basically let the, the, the lunatics run the asylum for a minute. And then by the time, yeah. and by the time the show was off, the lunatics were completely in control and they did whatever they wanted <laughs> along the way. Exactly. But that, but see, here's the thing. I remember that when I went to HBO, they, they make you read a book. At least they made me read a book about the history of HBO. And they talk about the fact that it started off with, you know, sports and movies and um, Fraggle Rock, which you go, That's, that doesn't make any sense. It's amazing. Yeah. Fraggle Rock was and amazing. And then you've got <laughs> Dream On and some of those shows that were trying to burst out that then didn't make it really, you know, for the long haul. And by the way, where is Brian Ben Ben? Because I haven't Thank seen you. him in three years. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> so I feel like then, and then they had to court big names. They had to court people. They had to court people because they didn't. Just like when I was at Fox and UPN, we were the also Rams, and everybody wanted to go to NBC and ABC and CBS because that's what everybody knew. And so, when you're building a a fledgling network, you need to to entice people and so we would kept going out to people and saying you can do whatever you want what do you want to do just push the envelope we can't look like abc and cbs we have to look different um than they do what what would you like to do will we'll let you have creative freedom um 
I think that's probably what HBO was doing at the same time, which was like, let me bring the Michael Patrick Kings over. Let me bring the Darren mm-hmm. Stars. Let me bring the David Chases. Let me bring the people who would like some creative freedom, who have the ability to run a show and who have something that has, that's a, a big swing and let's just give them the keys to keys of the kingdom. And then they had, you know, the David Simons of the world and they, they took off with that model of let's let the creator be the creator. So I do think that there was probably an evolution too at HBO that was saying, how do we entice people over here? Because we need to be not the weird thing on the side of they were cable. They were cable. They're not even Fox or UPM with there. They were networks. This is cable. It was like, Oh, how do you do that? How do you do that? You make it really, really enticing and you take a big swing on something that nobody else is going to do. And what's that? Well, nudity, it's going to be violent. It's going to be pushed content and it's going to be freedom for your creatives to come in. Right. And, and Oz and Oz came out before Sopranos, uh, which was also a very big show as well, but it was right. different than the Sopranos, how they, they worked it. And it's, it, you know, doing, doing the research I did on, on that episode, just as you look at, you know, it's just, it's one of those moments that just changed television forever. And, and, and we wouldn't have, I mean, I'm a big Breaking Bad fan. Like I love Vince Gilligan and I love everything he does. And, and you would have never had a show like that. It barely got on. <laughs> and, yeah, it, right. and it got on to a network, a network, a cable network, like AMC. They're like, what do you, don't you play like right. Citizen Kane and Gone with the Wind? You want to make shows now? <laughs> so that's the only reason, right. again, let the lunatic in. <laughs> let the, but I think Mad Mad's the same thing. Yeah, you know, same thing. Um, Matt was like, you know, he was on The Sopranos. He he that was, was right. He had this thing that he loved, and and then somebody allowed him to do the thing that he loved, and he just went for it, hundred percent. And he asked, and so he also I Matt. Think that's where you get those. Sorry, go ahead. no, no, no. I'm sorry, and, and Matt. They asked Matt, like, would you have been able to make Mad Men without Sopranos? And he's like, no. First, I wouldn't have been able to make it because it didn't exist. Secondly, I wouldn't have been able to make it because I didn't get to sit in that writers' room for right. as many years as I did, and and, and see how David broke it down. And, and broke right. down his stories and stuff. One other thing that was really interesting about, uh, and I'll get off the Sopranos kick in a minute, but it's a, it's just good. At, it's just a good educational television conversation. He never, he loved doing singular stories episodes that literally didn't really feed the plot of the series. Mm-hmm. Just like character development, just like right. episodes of just like, Hey, we're just going to talk about these three characters who have nothing to do with the overarching arc of the scene. That was also new. That was something that was it's not a procedural. It's a, it's a, you know. Right. So it's like a weird and thing. And I love that. Don't you, but don't you want more of that? Yes. I feel like I want more of that. And I don't feel like I get enough of that. I feel like sometimes we are, there's so much of a drive. And again, it gets back to executives. Who's got the courage to just let you have a two person conversation between, you know, want to do a play. Why don't we do more of that? Why don't we just sort of sit in the moment? It takes it takes uh it takes some courage. It takes some courage. And he was able to do it early on like episode like episode 5 college is the is that that episode's his favorite and that's the one that really changed. Mm-hmm. That's when the Sopranos became the Sopranos was episode 5. And it was he, that that whole episode had nothing to do with the story. It was about his relationship with his daughter and this rat that just came out of nowhere. And the executive forced him to make an, a scene to make the rat look a little bit worse than he did. Originally, the, there wasn't even a scene. Mm. It was just like Tony just killed a random guy that he says he was right. a rat because <laughs> they were scared. They, they were really scared. It was such edgy stuff at the time. Uh, and now you look at something like Dexter, which is like you're literally following a serial killer and and you're rooting for it. But a serial killer with a moral code. That's the and thing. You're, and you're invited into his thought process and you Correct. understand why he got the way he got. They were very, very smart about how they constructed Dexter, I think, and how you really went along for that ride because he's killing the bad guys. And who wouldn't want that? It's a, it, that it's a, when you're writing like that and when you're creating a show like that or a character like that, it is such a razor that you're dancing on. It's the, it's the blade of a yeah. razor. You're just like at any moment you can slip and get your head cut off. <laughs> I mean, it's right. because if you're, if you do one scene the wrong way or you break that code that you've created, just, uh, 
just a smidge, you lose your audience. So you're on the creative bloody edge of writing. And it's this, <laughs> it's, it, 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 that is a terrible visual, that is but it's, awful but, visual. but it's a it. horrible <laughs> visual, but it's, but it's, you really are, I mean, it's Dexter's. That's why I was bringing this horrible visual into mind, but, <laughs> but you're, as a writer, you, you are dancing a very, very thin line. If you, if you just go a little bit off, you can lose an audience. And that's why I think in that episode of Sopranos, the executives were like, I think, I think you're going way off the reservation here. And nobody's yeah. like, well, no one's ever gone that far. Let's see what happens. And oh, right. they're with us. They're still with us. Oh, they want more. And, and you keep going. But again, Tony Soprano as, as a character, his, his, the, he had somewhat of a moral compass. I mean, he wasn't just a horrible bad guy. He was a horrible human being. But yet you fell for him because of his mother issues. <laughs> right. Well, he was, but again, you know, go back to the Godfather. Uh, yeah. Everybody has a code, and they he followed the code, and so what he was doing, he had completely understandable reasons for what he was doing. Even though we wouldn't do that, he, it made sense in his world. And I think that that's when you when you do misstep, it's because you've completely gone out of the world. Uh, here's a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. I was just having this conversation yesterday with somebody about Walking Dead when they killed Glenn. Oh. And I said they crossed the line because that's not the world they'd set up for us. That's they completely took our trust and then they bashed it when they bashed his head in. And I stopped watching. I was a rabid, rabid. Fan. Yes. Loved every moment of it. But when Negan did that, I said, well, that they have betrayed my trust and I will no longer I will no longer give them my time. So I think you have to make sure that you're working within the rules of the world, too. So can I also say I was a rabid Walking Dead fan until Negan showed up? And it wasn't – for yes. me, it wasn't the moment that he hit Glenn, though. That was pretty horrible and painful. Uh, but for me, it was that whole season because they made a cardinal mistake uh, in that they created a villain that was too powerful. He, They never gave any wins. You didn't, I don't know if you saw that season or not, but they never gave any wins yes. to our heroes that we loved. The problem with a good villain is that they have to be able to be balanced with the hero. The hero has to have the ability to beat the villain. If not, it's a boring show or a boring game, a boring story. And that's the mistake they did because there was no – the whole season was just – they were just getting beat up. and Rocky was getting pummeled again and again by Apollo and he never got a shot in. And at the end – It was a boss battle every single episode. Exactly right. And then at the end of this – at the end of that that season, they're like, oh, look, he got a punch in. F you. <laughs> Screw you, man. I am out. And we, and, we, and we And we stopped watching. So even a show like that, because and then you saw, and when Negan showed up, you saw that the ratings just though. Mm. They started dropping. Because before, Walking Dead was like the biggest show on television. Right. But Negan showed up and they yeah. mishandled it. They, that was that bloody edge I was talking about. Right. They mishandled it and the, the zombie's head got cut off. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, let me. It was, so, it was such a beautiful, beautiful show up until that point. It was. It really was. It was a wonderful show before that. Um, now, I have to ask you, you've probably seen a bunch of pilots. You've written a few pilots in your life, I'm sure. Uh, what makes a good pilot? Oh, uh, that's a – wow. You just completely um, – you neekened me with that. I just neekened you with that. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> out of, I just left from cutting a zombie's head off to bam. <laughs> Right. I would say there are a number of things that make a good pilot. It's not just one thing, but it's a, a, a confluence of things. You have to be, sh- um, you have to be timely. So even if that thing that does not take place in this time, it needs to be relevant to net to today. So I think you have to be saying something that that makes a really great pilot. Um, you need a great character with a very unique point of view, and you need a construct or a world that they are in that is antithetical to who they are. So it makes the world hard for them to navigate. And I think if you have those things, you have the makings of a great pilot. So if you think about um, any of your your favorite pilots, let's go back to Breaking Bad. He is a very oh. meek chemistry teacher. Mm-hmm. And he gets into the most violent world possible. So he is a very, he's got a very specific set of skills, just like Liam Neeson does mm-hmm. in Taken. He has a very specific set of skills. <clears throat> he is ill-equipped to handle them against a very formidable world that he is entering into. So it's completely antithetical to who he is. Um, 
And I think at the time it was very, it was a, you know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, epidemics constantly in terms of the, the drug world. So I think it's incredibly, um, prescient kind of television making. Um, think about any of your favorite pilots. Think about, um, if you think about scandal, I, I talk about scandal in my, in the book. Um, you've got a, a woman who is a hard charger. She's, a badass from the very moment that she shows up on screen. And even before that, because there's a scene before she shows up on screen, um, you have a character telling another character, uh, don't you want to be a gladiator in a hat, a, a gladiator, uh, uh, for this, for, um, for Olivia. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And, and the woman goes, yes, of course, I want to be a gladiator. And then you cut to Olivia Pope at the time. I think it was a different name, but cut to her coming in. And she's um, she, the way they describe her in the in the in the script and on screen. She's just a badass. And then she comes into a, a scene where she's negotiating basically a, a, a kidnapping. And, and then you realize the kidnapping is they've kidnapped a baby. And you just go, I'm so sucked in and I cannot wait to see what happens next because I've never seen this character before. So she's a very, very great, it's an amazing character. And what, she, what world is she in? She's, she's a, a, re, a rebel. She's, she's a cowboy. She's in one of the most um, highly regulated rule, if, I don't know, uh, uh, regimented kind of um, – businesses in the world she's in politics and not only that but she's in love with the president of the united states so we've set everything up against her she's going to have to come up against the most formidable foes week to week um and it's exciting and we're we're leaning forward and we're all into politics we've all been into politics and you know barack obama's president maybe it was even bill clinton where you there were really charged you know, sexy men in the, in the, in the white house. Like there's a lot of stuff that that you can sort of glean from probably the time that it was, it came out along with this character in this particular place, but you want to then lean forward into character and into the world. So if you have those things, you're going to have a really great shot at pulling a pilot together. So from what you've just said though, one thing I, I, I grabbed onto was that unlike movie, because you only have 90 minutes to two hours in a movie, you generally have a villain. You have one villain, maybe two or three or a group of villains. But there's there's a very specific. You know who the bad guy is. Whereas in a show, those right. both those shows, yes, there are some adversaries, but there are brand new adversaries that can come in on a weekly basis, season wide basis, that will constantly give the character, uh, the lead the lead character issues. So on Breaking Bad. Um, he's basically you're you're entering a new world, and in that world, there is a thousand things that can kill you, uh, and that's yeah, what's that's exciting. True. As opposed to, I'm Batman, you're the Joker, and that's the series that doesn't work. That, and I think that's right. where a lot of pilots make mistakes is they they lean you up against a villain, and there could be one villain across a season, maybe even two or three right. seasons, but there are also others coming. You you really should be a and correct me if I'm wrong. In, in television that we're talking about, and we could talk about The Sopranos, Mad Men, uh, Dexter, all of them, they're not against one person or even a small group. It's generally a, an environment, a world that they're entering, that there's a thousand places where they can get, they can get their heads cut off. And, Absolutely. And that's, yeah, what makes, that's what makes really interesting television. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. They have to have many foes. Because it's if you whether you do it, it it's one, um, it's like an SVU. If we go back to an SVU or you go back to you know whatever those procedurals are, they're going to be it's going to be the the bad guy of the week. Sure. But then there's got to be yeah a system at place. It's the world is a is a dangerous place, so I have to fix the world. So yes, it's you're absolutely right. And it just keeps and and that and that opens you up for many seasons. You can keep going and going. Exactly. But but, but right. like with uh, with um. Heisenberg, uh, he, there was a point, there was an end point. There, there was a certain point where like, you, there was even, even my wife, when she was watching it with me, she was like, he's, he's starting to cross the line a bit. He's not the guy I started liking. 
I'm not rooting for him anymore. Mm. He's turning into, right. why am I, why do I like, why am I following that guy? And not that it, it took us off the show. It still was a genius show. But there were moments that you're just like, he's not a good guy anymore. He's not doing that. He's do mm-hmm. and he even said he's like, I don't I'm not doing it. Before I, at first it was for my family. Now it's because I like it. <laughs> and that was <laughs> and you're just like, oh, this is awesome. He's, so it was, uh it was like what it said, uh is turning Mr. Chips into Scarface. And Right, right. And, and it's And I think that that's also the beauty of now again when you talk about streamers and how are things how have things changed. We're no longer necessarily going to 100 episodes. So we don't have to keep it open for forever. You can have a story that does arc like a movie over, you know, five season, eight episodes or whatever it is so that you can tell the story that that needs to be told in that amount of time. And you don't have to belabor it. And you can see an end game, which I think is it actually makes our content better. You know, when you think about something like Lost and you go, oh, Lost was probably trying to figure out, hey, let's throw another monster. Oh, they, they, were they, the were yeah, they, they were lost. They were lost. They were definitely lost. Go, well, it was probably a factor of, well, we've got a, we've got another 22 episodes. What do we do now? <laughs> and we have to figure it out. <laughs> let's bring in, what were those characters, the, the three characters that nobody liked and everybody wanted to kill uh, off? And then it's they a finally smoke get monster. Lost. It's, it's like a sick. smoke monster. I yeah. mean, it's, it was, I stopped. <laughs> I couldn't. The pilot was fantastic. It was wonderful. Right. Uh, but at a certain yeah. point, you're just like, what's going on? And you're absolutely right. They needed to fill air. As opposed to in the right. streamers, you don't. Like, I know Stranger Things has, I think they're going to do five seasons and that's it. And I think Cobra Kai... Uh, another big show on Netflix, they're only going to do five seasons and that's it. Like there's an out, like there's only so many more seasons we can see <laughs> how many more characters you're going right. to bring back from the Karate Kid universe. <laughs> like at a certain point you're like, uh, okay, so now Daniel and, and Johnny are, okay, they're fighting together against the ultimate bad guys. Oh, okay. They're bringing back the guy from Karate Kid 3. Okay. We ran out after Karate Kid 3. Right. So how many more seasons do we got here, guys? <laughs> and they know it. And the creators. Mr. Miyagi is not coming back. Okay, right, can you, I would have exactly. loved it. would have been. Yeah, Mr. Miyagi would have been amazing. Imagine if Pat Morita was still alive. Oh, my God. That would have I been know. A, it would have made that show even better than it is. But anyway, um, so let me ask you, what are you up to now? What are, you, uh, what's the, what, are, what are the new shows you're working on now? I am a staff writer on a new show that just premiered on Fox Tuesday nights at 9 called Our Kind of People. It is amazing. I have had the best time of my life working in this writer's room. And it was, again, it was a goal from when I was first in the, you know, coming out of the gate and never got a chance to get in the writer's room. And this has been an amazing um, and incredibly fulfilling ride for me. So we started in May, at the end of May, uh, in the writer's room, we are now shooting episode 107. We have an order for 12. Nice. So we're writing episodes 9, 10, 11, 12. And it's, uh, I've learned a lot. I've learned a tremendous amount. I thought I knew a lot about the business and about development before I got in here, which has helped me quite a bit. But also just being in the writer's room and seeing how stories are broken and how things change and the reasoning for certain things and how to protect uh, characters in the show and it's been just phenomenal and every single day is like Christmas I cannot wait to get to work every day and isn't that a great feeling it's like you skip to work yeah it's like you yes it's like you skip to work and before, I go to work with a smile on my face every day and it's and it's hard for people to understand and I'm not doing it to rub into anybody's noses here that listening but like ha 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 no it took us a long time to get here and now we're like, oh, I'm happy. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, uh, it, it's just such a fulfilling feeling as opposed to like, oh, okay, I got some money, but I'm miserable. I got that big paycheck, exactly. but I'm miserable. I'm like, oh, the paycheck might be smaller, but I'm happy. And as you get older, you yeah. realize happiness is a really big thing, <laughs> much more than money. Yes. Much, much. I mean, you need money to live, but at a certain point, like, okay, what's, where do I have enough? And I don't have to right. keep doing something I don't like just to get more money to do what it's like happiness means so much more and being creative is even right. and being creative is even more than that um now i'm going to ask you a few questions to ask yeah. all my guests uh what is the sure. lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film industry or in life um i will say this 
this sort of ties both into what what you were saying and what I, and what we're talking about. I got uh, I've been I was married for twenty three years. The last five we were separated. So um, my big lesson was um, that I deserved joy and I wasn't living in joy. And didn't I deserve to live in joy? And so I had white knuckled it for quite a while. Now, this is granted, I'm best friends with, I love him so much. Mm -hmm. My ex husband is an amazing person. We are besties. We talk multiple times. We're always on, we're always texting. So I don't, this is not about him. This was about, I think this was really about being in the right place and being the right, being the right me, being 100% me. And when I found the right combination of what I needed in my life, my joy level just shot up incredibly. And I think it was all precipitated by the divorce because the divorce in 2015, when we started divorce proceeding, the year of 20, 2016 was I did a year of yes. And I just said yes to every single thing. And I ended up on six different continents, got a tattoo, met the Dalai Lama, was at the White House twice. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was, I, I just had a complete, I did ayahuasca twice. I just had this complete, let's just bust it open and do all the things that I felt like I had missed along the way. I had kept living in this very, very tiny little box and thinking that I was like, oh, I'm an executive. I've got it all, whatever it is. And I thought <laughs> to myself, what have I not tried? And why have I said to myself that I needed to do certain things in a certain way? So I just started living a bigger life. And part of that was I needed to not be attached to my ex-husband because I felt like he was part of that rigidity of you have the, the kids, you have the house, you have the, the dogs, and, and you don't do certain things. So I kind of went off the rails a little bit in 2016, which then snowballed into let's go back to, high, to, to, uh, to get my education, my MFA. I was almost going to say high school. Let's go back to high school. It kind mm. of felt like it. But I went back to school. I, I applied to Sundance. And again, it was – I was thinking, well, why, why why would I ever move out of this executive box? Because I'm – everyone's going to know me in a certain way. You can't mm. switch. <laughs> I was of that mindset. You know, I was I was drinking that Kool-Aid. And then I went, well, why, why was I thinking that? So why not change the – that thinking just start to challenge everything every assumption that I had made about my life and get back to what I wanted to be and who I wanted to be when I was 15 and 14 13 years old loving content and movies and wanting to be a writer so it really did take 35 years for me to get there mm -hmm. if not longer but it was so worth it because again, it's it's about living in joy. And why was I why was I okay not living in joy every day? Oh, we could so talk ourselves we could talk ourselves into a lot of stuff, can't we? Oh God, can we? You can. Yeah, spe but especially when that check shows up. <laughs> that's right. But if there's one, and you look, let me be honest. You know, I I my transformation, let's just say, my becoming the butterfly out of the cocoon. I don't know that it's for everybody. I'd like to think it is. But I have friends who complain about being where they are and just and never make the move and don't change. And I then have to say, look, I'm, I appreciate that you are feeling this way, but I can't listen to this anymore because either you do something or you don't. But not everybody is equipped to make that move. And I completely understand that. And that can be their journey and their life, and that's okay. So when I say I went out and I – made a big change. It does not to mean that everybody needs to go out and quit their job and completely go off the rails and do something different. It worked for me because I think I had, I had set myself up for it. There was a chain of events that made sense for it. I did go back to school and get my degree. You don't have to do that, but I was working and I was writing and then I was starting to show my stuff on social media and I was getting positive feedback that then gave me courage to go back to school, that then gave me courage to go to Sundance, that then gave me courage to be, to say no to a big opportunity at HBO. So there was a very specific chain of events. I didn't just walk in and quit <laughs> and say, I'm just doing this. I was financially ready to do it. I had saved some money. I was rolling into a first look deal at HBO. So 
I had a support system. So there were things that happened that made it possible. But as you started off talking about the universe, the universe making plans, you make plans and then the universe blows them apart. The universe also will catch you if you're living in that truth. Mm-hmm. And I had a perfect example of that, which is not only was when I said I'm going to leave HBO. And when the, when, when um, Chrissy Habegger had kept come to me and she said, do you want to have this big promotion? I said, I really don't. I'm, I'm content to sit here for another 18 months off my contract and I'll just write and I'll just enjoy it. And I, I know the job. But I'll just write it out. And she said, send me your script. She read the script within 48 hours and she called me back and she said, no, you have to do this. Well, that's part of the universe saying there's support there in a big way. And by July, I had my deal in place. I was rolling out and I was rolling into a deal. So the universe was then providing finances for me. Now, did I take a big hit financially? Yes. It's half of what I made at HBO. But it was still, it was enough. And that's all I needed was enough. So I got the deal, and a week after I left HBO, so it was a Thursday, that was my, my last day, it was a Thursday, July 17th, something like that, it was my last day at HBO. The last day I was going to get a paycheck from, from my regular job, mm-hmm. and I was rolling into this deal that was going to pay me half, and a week later I had the book deal. A week later I got the call that I had the book deal. So again, it's the universe saying, you think you're going to – fall off the face of the earth. You think you're probably going to drown. You, you don't know what's going to happen. You may or may not sell anything. You may or may not get on staff. Guess what? I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you this book. This book is going to come and be part of the next part of your life. And I had that book to deal with, <laughs> deal with, to write over the next four or five, six months or whatever. And it was, again, another, another piece of the puzzle. So I do feel as though, even though we sometimes feel as though the universe is is kicking us in the teeth constantly. The universe can also bring us some of these blessings and joy that we aren't expecting that can help nurture and satisfy us in a different way. And where can people find your new book, Executive, The Executive Chair? It's going to be released on Amazon next week on Tuesday the 12th. So that's uh, so by the time this comes out, it might already have, have been, but mm-hmm. it's it's going to be on Amazon. It will be on mwp.com, the Michael Weezy Productions uh, website. It will eventually be at Barnes & Noble. I think you can probably search for it online and, and probably find other booksellers that, that will have it. Mm-hmm. But uh, but if you like it, please leave a nice like review. Good- mm-hmm. you like it, leave it on, yeah, a nice review on Amazon. I hope people get something out of it. <laughs> My goal with the book is really to give people the tools that they might not have otherwise had about how to navigate some of the ins and outs of the industry and and to know what's in an executive's head so that you can navigate that more effectively than you might have uh, not otherwise had the um, have that advantage. So it's with good intentions that I put that out there in the world. Kelly, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you on the show today. I know we can keep going for a little while longer, for sure. <laughs> we can geek out <laughs> about television for a while. But I appreciate you uh, coming on the show. And thank you for putting the book together. And uh, I wish you nothing but the best in your new endeavors. Uh, and I'm uh, not you. to sound condescending, but I'm proud of you. Uh, I'm oh, proud that you that. that you took the – you jumped. It's, it, it takes bravery to, to leave a cushy job. And to leave a, a good paycheck, yes. and 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 as you get older, it gets even more risky. So that you did it, and you've landed on your feet, and you're happy is hopefully uh, an example that everybody listening can can take to heart. So thank, thank you so you. much, Kelly. Thank you for having me. This has been amazing, and I appreciate what you do. This is <laughs> what you do is is uh, is it just gives me life. It really does. I love listening to your podcast. So thank you for for you. I want to thank Kelly so much for coming on the show, dropping her knowledge bombs, and it was just an absolute delight having the conversation with her. So Kelly, thank you so much. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to get her new book, The Executive Chair, A Writer's Guide to TV Series Development, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 144. Thank you guys so much for listening. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 